Well, hello there and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor, your host, and today I have a yet another car review. This is a 2023 Nissan Aria. This is the Evolve Plus front-wheel drive single motor variant that I have here. Very excited to be back in the saddle, back in the seat with Nissan, of course. It's been a while since they've come out with a, a new EV, so I'm really happy to uh, have the time and the uh, pleasure to be driving this vehicle around. So certainly I want to thank Nissan Canada, of course, for allowing me the use of this vehicle for several days. So let me go through all my usual ramblings about the vehicles and what I think, and uh, hope, hope you enjoy the show and learn something about this really, really nice vehicle. So like I said, I'm very excited to be back in an all-electric Nissan vehicle that's not the LEAF. Of course, many of you know my first EV was a 2018 40 kilowatt hour Nissan LEAF, and I absolutely love the vehicle. Uh, even though with the trials and tribulations of fast charging the LEAF, it was a great vehicle. We had no issues with it in two and a half years of ownership. I just needed for work something that had more range and faster charging. So worked my way up into a Tesla Model 3 after that. But while we had the Nissan LEAF, we certainly loved it. But of course, I think that was a bit of a missed opportunity for Nissan to introduce a refresh, uh, a very, very, uh, you know, technology refresh as well for the 2018 Leaf. They did a nice job in the, you know, in the styling and added some features, even changed some of the chemistry in the batteries for the 40 and the 62 kilowatt or uh, plus version, but it still had the non-thermal management uh, cooling and, you know, heating properties that we need uh, all, e all electric EVs with proper BMS to have. So that was something that they were lacking and that was an opportunity. And I had mentioned that that was a missed opportunity for Nissan. Well, that's not the case in the Aria. It's a totally redesigned um, EV from the ground up, its own platform, dedicated platform for this vehicle. And they've done everything, brought it up to modern specs. So I'm gonna go through some of this. Now, let's start about the design on it. Now this is a mid-size SUV. Uh, that's the segment that Nissan's going after in this class. So it's a little bit bigger than the Rogue, which is their best-selling product. So it's kind of between the Rogue and the next level up. I believe it's the Pathfinder or the Murano. I think it's the Murano. Don't remember all their models every year. So it's got the, the exterior size, uh, almost like a Rogue, slightly bigger, and but it's got the interior of a Murano without the full size of that. So it's kind of a neat vehicle. And again, because of those all electric platforms, you can design flowing lines. You can design really nice exteriors and really nice interiors and take advantage of all that room. Um, and one of the things I'll say up front is Nissan told me they didn't put a frunk on this vehicle because they wanted to maximize interior space. That was their goal. And if they put a frunk, it would have brought it brought in some of the, the front elements of the, um, the dash and the HVAC and all that kind of stuff a little bit more into the compartment and they didn't want that. So, you know, whether you love a frunk or hate a frunk or don't really care, this car doesn't have one. So I won't be showing you anything there. Really nothing to see under the hood, uh, but you know, stuff that we've seen in other vehicles, but I will show you that. So, you know, that's their, their methodology and that's their thinking around the Aria in that design. You know, it's, it's a simple modern design. They've given this balanced approach. They say it's not polarizing. I don't think it's polarizing. I think it does stand out a little bit. It does turn some heads. I've had people look at this and say, one, one person came up and commented that, hey, it's a really nice looking vehicle. So I think it's a really nice flowing design um, that is modern. And they've taken that design into the interior, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But it's very driver centric. So you sit up high, you have a nice visibility, nice lines, clean lines inside and outside. And you've, you've got that uh, modern but not hectic type of approach. It's a really, really calming, very practical design language that's in here and all the, the different elements. And it's very comfortable to drive and I will talk about the driving experience coming up later on. So, you know, overall in the design, I like it. I think it's a great looking vehicle. Um, I can tell you that it fits really nicely in my garage. It's uh, slightly less uh, in length than my Model 3, if I remember my numbers, or pretty close because I can get it in with a room to spare in my garage where I park my Model 3. So that's nice. It'll fit comfortably in, in uh, house uh, garages. It still has a lot of room for five people uh, in this vehicle. And I think the exterior design language with everything going on is very, very nice. And I think Nissan did a great job. Now, before we go into the interior, let's continue on. And let me talk about the powertrain because there's multiple variants of this unit. So I'll pop open the hood so that you can see what's on here. It does require a prop rod, doesn't have struts. I'm not sure why Nissan likes prop rods, so that's what it is. 
So this is a single motor front wheel drive vehicle. It comes both in front wheel drive or all, dual motor all wheel drive variants. And there's five different models. The one I'm testing here is the Evolve Plus in Canada. There are equivalents in the US, but you'll have to go check those or in Europe, check out what the model numbers because all the names tend to change quite often as they go from geo to geo. But in Canada, we have six models involved, um, three uh, th available. Three of them are all-wheel drive, and three of them are front-wheel drive because there's six variants um, that are available from the Engage, um, the Adventure, uh, the Evolve, and then the Platinums and the Evolve E-Force. Anything that has E-Force on it shows, represents that it's an all-wheel drive dual-motor variant. Now, there's a couple different battery pack sizes on these. Um, there's an, uh, the base uh, Engage and Evolve E-Force come with 63 kilowatt hour battery packs and the other four models, the Venture, the Evolve and the Platinums uh, come with um, 87 kilowatt hour battery packs and that's what this one has here. So as far as power goes, there's different power ratings but they go from 214 um, horsepower uh, to 389 is the top spec in the uh, Premier uh, E-Force. Uh, four horsepower and then from uh, torque they go from 221 pound-feet up to 442 in the premier e-force again pound-feet uh, pound of torque so you get these variances of 0 to 60 or 0 to 100 kilometers an hour because I'm looking at Canadian specs uh, anywhere as fast as 5.1 seconds for the top specs down to 7.6 seconds which is what this one has for the single motor um, uh, front-wheel drive versions now we'll talk about charging since I talked about the battery specs. This does have uh, support a pretty good rate of DC fast charging. It is a standard CCS and I'll show you a close up of this. I like that it's in the front so you can pull into a charging outlet a little bit easier for some people rather than backing in. The way it is, standard CCS, right combo, level one, uh, level two, and of course your plugs. They've graduated from Chatamo to CCS on this vehicle, so that's a major differentiator over the Leaf, of course, still uh, carrying the Chatamo standard. So it's nice to see that they have upgraded this. Now, from a charging speed, they claim uh, 130 kilowatts for quick charge for DC fast charging, um, 7.2 kilowatt for AC level one. Now on the quick charge, I, I will show you a quick charge coming up because I did go early this morning to uh, my usual spot at Toronto Premier Outlets, uh, Electrify Canada, a DC fast charger to, to test this because I really wanted to see, I was very curious about the charging curve. I've seen a bunch of charging curves and they seem to be all over the map. So I wanted to give it a go. So I will give you, show you that information coming up very, very shortly. But they do claim 40 minutes uh, for the 87 kilowatt battery pack for um, 10 to 80% in 40 minutes. I think that's well within the 30 minute kind of average window that we're seeing now. We're seeing, of course, the South Koreans claim 10 to 80 in 18 minutes. I did a test, I was around 22, so probably 20 minutes. Um, we're seeing some of the Germans get into the 30, 32, 35 minute range for that 10 to 80. So Nissan is claiming that um, in the larger battery pack size of 40 minutes. Now, if you get the 63 kilowatt hour battery pack size, then that drops about five minutes. So you go from 10 to 80 in 35 minutes. So again, well within that half hour window, which I think is very acceptable. Remember folks, it was, it was only three or four <laughs> short years ago when 50 kilowatt was it. That was the, the game in town, right? And we all were living with that and we were living with 45 minute to an hour 15 to 90 minute charging uh, times for DC fast charging stops. So to bring that down into 20 to 30 minute time frame, I think is really, really good. Um, and, and you know, again, as I mentioned on the last episode with the Mercedes, you get out, you do a few things after driving for a couple of hours, 20 to 30 minutes goes by pretty quick. So I think that that's really good charging and I will show you, uh, in fact, I'll put it in right now how my charging experience was all right so stopping here to do a uh, level three charge on the nissan aria see what kind of numbers i get um tried to drive this down throughout the week i'm down to 12 percent so i'm going to go to 80 percent and see how long that takes i'm at an electrify canada my usual one at a 150 kilowatt uh, uh, charging station uh, the nissan's rated up to 130 kilowatts for max peak so uh, let's start this and see what happens so yeah, there's a screen that tells you the maximum. I have it set to pull the maximum at 130 because you can throttle that uh, on the menu selections. So it's showing you, it's telling me that to get to 80, I sh it should take about 25 minutes. Um, let's see if that holds true. All right, so I started here at a, the 150 uh, kilowatt CCS, Electrify Canada fast charger, and uh, started up 12% state of charge. 
started pulling 39 kilowatts as it ramps up. Let's see how it can go. I, I got the battery, drove about 25 kilometers to get here, so I don't know how warm the battery is. But I started my timer and we'll see how long it takes. It's telling me it's gonna take an hour and a half to get to 80%. I don't think that's going to be right. I think it's going to um, start gaining some speed here as it warms up and starts putting some more energy. At 39, of course, it would only do that. So let's see what happens. I'll, I'm gonna monitor this as I keep going. All right, so it's been about six minutes and I'm still at 39 or 40 kilowatts. I thought it might ramp up by now because it's at 17% state of charge. So it, sometimes it's the station. So I'm going to stop this charge and I'm gonna reinitiate at one of the other ones here, just make sure they're working. Uh, looks like the number one CCS is working here. And there's another one over here that uh, looks like it's working too. So I've got a couple more selections. So I'm gonna move over probably to the end one here. It's a 150 and yeah, number one is ready. And I'll uh, see if I can start the charge and if it'll uh, start faster. All right, so changing stations have seemed to uh, solve some problems because as soon as I plugged it in, it started ramping up, as you can see, to 120 kilowatts. So something was up with that other station. Now it's telling me uh, uh, it's going to take me, I think, 20 some, uh, 22 minutes to get to 80, and that would be about right. So had I started this charge five minutes ago, um, I would be probably within that 20 to 25 minute window. So I'm gonna let it run and uh, see what it peaks at. It's at 121. That's probably going to be my peak on this. It might might trick a little more as it heats up into the 30 percentile, but uh, we'll keep an eye on it. All right, so I'm done the charging. It actually hit 80 percent, and I stopped it. It's showing 79, but it was pretty close to 80. Um, it uh, took 30 minutes to get from 18 to 80 uh, percent. If you add the slower charging, which was at six minutes, if I were to uh, summarize that I started on a good working station on this one it probably would only took a couple of minutes to get that uh, uh, that percentage that I got so I would say the 32 to 35 minute range to get from 10 to 80 percent is very valid in this case I'll show you the graph that I put together and we'll walk through it so if we take a look at the charging graph uh, that I created for this charge you'll see the different states of charge uh, Percentages that I started with at 18% ended at 80% and kind of walked through what the pulls were during specific points in time at that state of charge. I didn't write down the, the time uh, for each of those state of charges, but I did end, um, which was 30 minutes later. So at least I have a start and a stop time there. And you can see on the graph, and that's a good visual representation of, of how the charge is, that it maintains a pretty good charging curve, right? It, it, it keeps at the 120-ish realm from uh, below 20% uh, up until uh, oh, just past 50%, and it starts to slowly taper down to 80% where it finished at 75 kilowatts of charge pull. I think that's pretty good. That's a pretty reasonable and safe charging curve, and I think Nissan's done a great job in programming and mapping that so that you can take road trips and not have to take too long to charge. So talked about battery and charging with about the range on this vehicle. Well, it ranges anywhere from 330 kilometers up to 490 kilometers. So obviously the single motors variants are going to give you longer ranges because they draw less power, the front wheel drive versions. And that's the, the Venture Plus is their longest range model. That's the one that has 490 kilometers with that uh, motor giving you, uh, you know, again, a 7.6 seconds zero to 100, but that's plenty enough to, Folks, they get up to speed and pass people on a highway. Um, so uh, you really need to check the specs depending on what your range is and what you feel that you want to get. Now, again, I'm going to talk about my driving range for the week coming up. These are EPA rated numbers, so I would take them a little bit lightly. Uh, when it comes to Nissan, they tend to not be 100% accurate in their ranges. I know that they do testing and this is what they come out with, but I'm going to talk about real world. It's not that far off, but definitely not um, going to be uh, the 465 that uh, that this car is rated for, but I wasn't that far off, so I will talk about that coming up. So let's talk about cargo space on this. I, again, I do love that it's a hatchback design, gives you much more flexibility. I actually put a pretty fair size piece of furniture that I had to pick up earlier this week in that. Had to still put a little bit of bungee cord to close down the lid, but it fit mostly all the way in, so I love having these bigger openings. This does have a removable partial shelf, but what you see here with the main deck is about 23 cubic feet or 65, 600, 
uh, in 51 liters behind the second row um, of space here. You get, um, that's including this subsection here, uh, which is about oh, five or six inches thick deep. Because the single motor is up front, you don't have the rear motor. So this space is actually very usable to store stuff. So I've got the charging cable. You can put quite a lot of items down here in that six inches and, and get stuff underneath here um, that you want to carry around. And you have these two panels that come up that you can remove in its, their entirety if you want uh, and put them down there. So it's quite, quite handy to have that. Uh, here you got a couple of side holders, don't mind my garbage, you have a couple of side holders for like your windshield washer fluid and that kind of stuff. Now when you put these seats down, uh, they tell me that you get 60 cubic feet, again taking this partial shelf off and I'll show you pictures and stuff uh, and do some video in here, or 1700 liters of space, which is a pretty good amount of space. I think in this class it's a fair size. Also, I just wanted to, to tell you that this partial sh shelf or cover, whatever you want to call it, security cover, comes out really easy. It's just kind of laying on there and gravity, uh, gravity uh, is holding it down along with those. So once you take it off, again, you have a pretty big open space here to put stuff on that's unobstructed. So it's, it's a nice use of space, easy to take off. You can throw that behind the, the rear seats. It'll sit there standing up nicely. Easy to put those seats down. There are 60, 40, or it looks like a 70, 30 split on these ones. Um, so you can still carry a person and put something long in here, which is kind of what they wanted to do. Also wanted to add the nice low lift over. So uh, I've seen some where you have to lift another couple inches higher. This is a really easy low lift over to pick up stuff and put it in, your know, groceries, that kind of stuff. I do like when they think of these things. All right, let's see how it is to get in the back seat. Uh, I really love how these doors open quite far, as you can see. I always say about 90 degrees is, is the idea. This is pretty close, I would say probably like 85 or 80 degrees. So it's pretty wide opening. Got to be careful when you're in tight parking spots. But of course, that is all for families, right? Easy to get kids in and out, easy to get car seats, pets, all that kind of stuff. And these class of vehicles need these kind of things because that's what they're used for. So I do like that. It sits higher, so it's easy to get in. Lots of room for me to get in. I'm about 5'7". Excellent, lots of leg room. I have the seat where I have it. I have two fists of leg room. I have one fist of head room here. So if you're really tall, you might be have to slouch down a bit. But all in all, it's very comfortable. This does have the power sunroof, so it's going to take up probably about an inch and a half or so of the ceiling because of that, um, that option. You can get these, I believe, without the sunroofs to get a little bit more roof line. But very comfortable but interior. I like it. It's, it's uh, lots of room. I've heard some people say, complain that it's not a lot of room. And I don't know where they're getting this from because I have lots of room four people for sure five it's going to be a bit of a squeeze especially with chubbier people like me in the seats but it'll work and uh you know i think they've done a good job grab bars one thing they got grab bar bars on every door some sometimes a lot of the guys that build uh, suvs don't uh, count on the driver having a grab bar so there's grab bars everywhere here uh, nice pockets it's a nice interior very comfortable good job all right, so now we've looked at the exterior and all the stuff, let's uh, talk a little bit about the interior. The area's interior looks futuristic and minimal. Now Nissan has discarded every button possible in pursuit of a smooth dashboard that favors a sleek look to match the design of the exterior. Despite Nissan's claim that area's cabin is unlike a traditional automotive interior, its minimalistic theme appears to be its sole unique trait. Not that the cabin isn't a nice place to spend time, it certainly is. It has a flat low floor that creates a spacious feeling inside and Nissan has incorporated its comfy zero gravity seats into the design. The rear space is noticeably uh, less generous than the front, but a pair of adults will still find it comfortable and roomy, even though for long distance travel. The use of haptic technology is in fair different places, and I do like the different storage elements, like the storage tray that pops out and the fair size glove box. There's a lot of nice features in the ambient lighting, installations that are around the cabin as well as again that really nice sleek looking dash with the two displays which i'm going to talk about in more detail in a second 
they've done a really good job at upgrading that technology and bringing it up to today's standards that most people are familiar with. Uh, again, that dash with that nice minimalistic design, haptic touch. At first, I was kind of trying to really push hard on these, but you don't. You just basically touch them like that and see it comes on already. So it's just basically a light touch. Um, and that's all you have to do with these. I was trying to push to get it here a click, but it's really just touch sensitive and they work quite well. You've got a nice um, main infotainment screen. You can see it's fairly responsive here. I had a device connected, I unconnected. So you can, I, I believe you can play around with this and some it moved and changed the cards around to get some of the different apps uh, that are coming up. It's got a lot of different kind of apps on here. For your EV stuff, you know, again, your energy usage, see what's going on here for your history. I haven't been using much in the last while because I've been sitting here filming um, your driving range of course giving you that kind of uh, egg view that Nissan was famous to come out with first I believe they were one of the early ones if, where they're charging stations so you can filter on different things uh, you can set your charge timers here for home if you want to just charge at certain times a day of course and then you can set your climate control for preconditioning departure so in the winter you want the car to be nice and warm at 20 or 21 degrees C before you leave the garage and in the winter, it will do that. So some nice functions here, uh, even stuff like where am I, you know, like it'll give you a street by street kind of thing uh, where you are. Now I'm in a parking lot of a school, so it's not going to know the street that I'm on, but it's giving me a map of the general area, which is correct. So that's pretty good. You can even get um, Latin longs if you want on this thing. Uh, which, it, which it gave me there. Um, you can download some apps. So there is a bit of an app store for this. Uh, the SMX, uh, there's a GPS, so it can give you a kind of a really cool uh, GPS and, and uh, alt approximate altitude as well. So there's a lot, a lot of cool stuff on here. The, XM, uh, the SXM integration worked well and the TomTom Tom weather as well because it was popping up with weather advisories and you can actually, I think, even see a map if there's something going on here. Um, I don't see it now. Let me just see what these come, uh, if the weather comes up with, uh, yeah, you can actually load some maps, which is pretty cool. So it looks like where I'm getting, I'm just going to beat out the filming here because we got a nice uh, wall of, uh, of rain coming in here. And this is something that's really cool. Now I know it's it's Sirius XM integration. You'd have to subscribe to Sirius XM to get this, but this is something that Tesla people, we've been asking Tesla to do is to integrate a weather map into the always on nav screen. Because in the Tesla UI, of course, you, uh, most of the screen is taken up by the nav. And it would be great to have this kind of information so you know if something's coming. Uh, this doesn't move. This just, you, you can zoom in and out and it's a point in time capture, right? When you when you look at this. But this is really cool and, and something, you know, that Nissan didn't have before. I was getting weather alerts, you know, stuff from the States because we're we're not that far away. Uh, if there's anything on the alert map, you know, it's it's even showing the States, you know, where, where, there's, uh, where there's some potential weather alerts coming up in here in the green. So it's a pretty cool function. I won't spend a lot of time on that. But, you know, it's something that's really nice. And um, I think that they've done a great job on that and on different, you know, screens. Again, you can play around with and see, but pretty responsive. Now you can set up a profile. I haven't set up a profile. Uh, so one thing that I did mention to Nissan is I wish that the, because um, uh, I set this to uh, eco mode all the time, which is done by these haptic controls here. You just press the drive mode and then it changes from sport to um, eco to um, uh, standard, of course. It defaults to standard, but every time I start the car, I have to go back into eco. It does have the E-step button here. And the, and the E-step is basically similar to their one pedal, but it doesn't take you into full one pedal driving. And I might as well talk about that now until I, uh, so I won't do it when I'm moving. But it basically slows you down to about 12 or 10 kilometers per hour, where then you need to use the brakes. It will kind of just coast at that or creep at that speed, five to 10 kilometers an hour until you use the brakes. So you do have to use the physical brakes to come to a stop. There is a hold button on here and that's down there. Uh, it has auto hold. And when that's lit, that means that it's engaged. It does stay on. So if you turn it on, every time you start the car, it will stay on. So that's a good feature. There are some other controls that disengage the uh, lane uh, keeping because sometimes it's a pain you can do that. So uh, I, I wish, you know, that they would have a retain for the driving mode and maybe that's in the profiles. I don't know, but it could be there. The driver's binnacle, nice and clean, right? Lots of, uh, lots of information here um, that you can get. You can also see music and stuff. Um, you have your driving, you have your music, what's going on, your compass and, and different like Nissan style from the Leaf. They've got some different toggles within that. Um, some of these fonts look very familiar. If you're a Leaf owner, you will say, hey, this looks exactly like a Leaf. 
and it does. It was kind of a bit of a coming home looking at this stuff. Even the the drive computer stuff, you know, is uh, is very similar to to the Leaf look, especially the the the, the Gen two Leafs where they've uh, done this. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's pretty good that way. There's there's a lot of stuff that you can play with on the settings. I'm not going to go, but it's all very similar. Um, there is a um, uh, heads up display on here. See if I can get that on camera. I think you can see that here. There it is. Uh, it's just minimal right now. Um, it, it will show if you're in uh, adaptive lane keeping and adaptive cruise and all that stuff. Those symbols will come up if you're in Pro Pilot version 2, which this vehicle has. It'll come up on there. Um, but um, I, I couldn't find a way to turn it off. Now, Nissan tells me there is a button to turn it off, but I couldn't find it anywhere. So I'm going to have to search the owner's manual. If any of you out there know how to turn, up the he turn off the heads-up display on these, please put it in the comments. I'd love to know how because I've searched through every single menu option several times and I just couldn't find it. So lots of pretty comprehensive settings on here um, that you can play with, of course, EV stuff, maintenance units, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to go through them. So all in all, a very comfortable environment. Uh, the frameless mirror is an option here where it has, um, I believe, well, this one doesn't have the home link, but some of the mirrors will have home link options as well. So you can incorporate garage doors. Now this does have a nice size roof on it a panoramic roof option i've got it covered so i like that there's a cover here that you can open it opens halfway if you just want it for the drivers or if you want it all the way back for the passengers then it'll go all the way back which is nice and it also has a sunroof that actually opens so it tilts open and then if you want it opened off you go and you'll open it up and i do like to have that you know i love the glass roof in, in my model 3 but man does it get stinking hot in that car it really, really gets hot. So this is a nice way that you can beat the heat a little bit and uh, and have that open and get some air. So all in all, a very comfortable, nice uh, cabin, nice, comfortable, uh, big mirrors, of course. You can set your driving uh, uh, seats once you've got it. This one has the power seat options. You can store two different choices. Got ambient lighting as well, which is pretty cool. It's a really nice, calming design, a very pleasant vehicle to drive, as I'll talk about. Um, nice size mirrors. So let's go for a quick drive. All right, so just some quick thoughts on the driving. Uh, as I've been mentioning, you know, this is a, a very comfortable vehicle. It's really, really easy to drive. If you hear any clanging noises, it's just because of my filming sign that I put in the back here uh, when I come out to public spaces and film. Um, so I'm just gonna drive around the subdivision because we've got rain coming soon. So I'm just gonna try to wrap this up. But, and I've got the sunroof open, so you'll hear a little bit of noise uh, from the wind as I go, but I'm gonna go fairly slow through here. So it's a very comfortable car. I mentioned that it's quiet. It's super quiet. Not the quietest ones out of there, but very quiet. And you know, I think all EVs are quiet, especially all electrics. They're pretty well all quiet. They've reached that that threshold of, of uh, insulation, sound insulation, and some of them offer um, uh, electronic sound dampening and uh, controls for lessening the sound. So I think they've all done a pretty good job on that now. So I don't think I need to probably cover that a lot. Uh, this is no exception. This does a really, really good job. Um, you know, it does make a very low pedestrian hum when you're down at the slower speeds here. Um, it works really well. Uh, again, I have to, um, I have it in E-step. So E-step, as I mentioned, takes you almost to a stop. Um, it's, it's a little bit more generation. So this has two, three types of generation, re regeneration, sorry. Zero, nothing. So you're coasting. It has B mode like it did before in the Leafs. And it would be, you know, a, it would be less regeneration than it is an E-step. And what E-step is, it's not one pedal driving. So it's not E-pedal, which will take you to a stop and hold you. It's just one level down. So you'll drive, it will slow you down. It will put maximum, as much regen as it can. And sometimes it goes all the way to the maximum level that it shows on the display if I'm, if I'm letting off at high speed. And then once I slow down, I have to use the physical brake for the rest of it. And then once I stop and have enough pressure on that brake for a second or two, the auto hold, if I have it turned on, will engage, the brakes will clamp, the physical brakes will hold, and uh, then you can take your foot off the, the brake pedal and you're stopped. So the one pedal, you don't have a true one pedal, you have this E-step. And, and I'm not sure why Nissan did, the, did that, because I asked them, I said, why did you move away from... Uh, e-pedal because a lot of people like it and they said you know they pulled a lot of leaf owners and I don't know where and the majority said they didn't like it so they adopted this kind of hybrid model where it doesn't take you fully there so it gives you enough regeneration you know to to slow you down but doesn't take you to a full stop so I don't know why people don't like that I think it's great once you learn one pedal driving and again it's something you can turn off and on so I'd rather have that ability to have full one pedal driving 
than not have it. That's just me. Other than this, you know, again, everything's clearly visible. You've got your HUD, you've got all your controls, everything is within reach. So it's a very nice, capable vehicle to drive. I've taken it on a couple of longer trips this week, uh, kind of going across town. Uh, again, uh, pleasure to drive. It's comfortable, boy, much more comfortable than my Model 3, even with my modified softer suspension. This is even nicer. Uh, so it's got a really good suspension. It's not adaptive. It's not electronically controlled. It's just a set suspension package, kind of standard, um, but it does a really good job on it. It's comfortable. It's got lots of room for for people and stuff. I think it's a very practical vehicle overall, and I think Nissan's done a good job. It's got that raking roof line, so it does have front sensors. When you get close to something, the camera will come on and show you what's going on. So it's got your standard front camera, it's got your rear camera, and it's got the two side cameras on the mirrors. Nissan patented that 360 view, which everybody uses now, and it works okay. You know, I don't think it's earth shattering, but it works really well, and it's very capable. Uh, the cameras that come on, and they have ultrasonic sensors as well to beep at you if you're getting too close to something. So it's a very good solid system overall on that. And again, I think they've, they've done a good job with this um, in making it a very pleasant driving experience, making it comfortable, lots of room in the front, uh, just, just a nice airy feeling for the area. So thumbs up. All right, so here at the Nissan Aria, uh, running their version of ProPilot 2 on this. And uh, as you can see, I'm on the highway. I've got the heads up display. I'm not sure if you can see that heads up display or not. There it is, I've got to get to the right angle. Uh, for that, but you can see it shows uh, the green for ProPilot being on and if I zoom in a little bit, what your speed is set at and any warnings that come up. Now this this is very sensitive, about every five to 10 seconds it comes up and warns you. So if I let go of the wheel here, you'll see it comes up <laughs> within five seconds uh, to ask you to grab the wheel. So they're very angsty about um, leaving this unattended for any amount of time. Yeah, that's only a few seconds. Um, after I nudge it there, as you can see, probably about five seconds and then it comes up and starts the warning. Now, the way Nissan did this before is it would start beeping after a while and then if you still didn't respond, it would tap the brakes a few times, a couple of times just to see if you're alive. And then if that didn't work, it would put the hazards on and actually slow down and stop in lane. Um, a good thing and a bad thing. If you're in the middle of the highway, if you're on a middle lane here and you stop dead, boy, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Um, so, but I could see on a two lane road, it would be all right, you know, and, and uh, there's no way, I guess, for it to pull over to a shoulder. So it's a good thing and a bad thing that it stops the car at least, but uh, depending on where you are and what situation uh, may not be good. So you really got to kind of turn this wheel. I'm actually giving it some aggressive turns here when it asks me to, uh, uh, to make sure that my hands are on the wheel. Um, so it does sense when my hands are on the wheel here, but if I take them off, then uh, it'll come back on after a couple seconds again here. And you've got to give it a good a good nudge there. So, so now I've got a car that came out in front of me and now it's adaptively slowing down, as you can see here, uh, by the Speedo doing 93. I gotta keep my hand on the wheel on this. Um, and then keeps a good spacing. So it wasn't an aggressive slowdown, it was pretty good. And now it's slowly keeping my spacing. I think I have it set for uh, two car lengths. Um, I haven't checked the settings on this, I guess I should three car lengths, two, one, three. So three is kind of the max on this number, three, two, one. So I'll leave it at three, which is the safest and uh, go from there. So it keeps the lanes pretty well. I haven't had to, to nudge the vehicle around at all. So now I'm going to just signal here and see, does it take over? No. All right, so in a signal you have to, it will disengage the system and then you have to manually do it. So from what I can tell so far, there isn't any automatic lane changing um, apparatus here on this, uh, like there are in some other vehicles. Um, so I'm going to disengage it now since it's coming up to um, a bend in the road, which I don't need it. But all in all, um, it was pretty good. Again, one thing I noticed when I had my Nissan Leaf in 2018 and when they came out with, with e-pedal and ProPilot, next to Tesla, they really were the first OEM to kind of grasp that technology and, and make it work. I know GM has Super Cruise and some others, but the e-pedal for what it was worked really well. And it kind of was the trend center for the one pedal driving. And the ProPilot worked really well considering that it was a one camera and one radar uh, unit system. So it only had one camera and one radar sensor in that system and it worked extremely well for that type of system and uh, this I'm understanding has multiple sensors. I don't think it has multiple radars but certainly multiple sensors. Just get into lane here. Um, 
So it actually, you know, will, will, should work even better in this version of Pro Pilot 2, I believe it's called. Um, so I'll have to see if it does the lane changing later on, but uh, right now I don't think it does. But all in all, a good, decent, smooth system. I hope you enjoyed the driving and all that information as well. Now, uh, price points on these, uh, they range starting in Canada from 55,000, 55, eight and change, up to 70, just, uh, just under $73,000 Canadian. So it's a pretty broad price range for the six models that are available, the six trims that are available. They do all qualify for the $5,000 federal rebate. I believe the top specs do. Um, I, because they did increase that, so I do believe it, it, they top specs do, but you'll have to double check that on the website. Um, but again, so that's gonna make uh, getting some money back on these um, helpful for that such large of a purchase. Um, and I think that that's pricing. It's, it's gonna be interesting to see how Nissan does with that pricing, because it's a very competitive field you know, in that, in that level, and I'll talk about competition in a sec. And just to wrap up on pricing, this particular model that I had is 68, just over $68,000. Uh, the only option was the clear, uh, the pearl metallic paint, the blue here, two-tone. It's two-tone because blue and black. I like the two-tone, I like the white actually better on this particular vehicle, but it's a really, really nice paint color. Again, a lot of people have commented on that. Competition-wise, so like I said, that mid-size SUV has got to be the number one spot for electrification that we saw. We saw everybody get into it with SUVs and start pumping out, you know, various price SUVs and even CUVs, you know, like some of the Ionic 5s and that kind of stuff, which, but that's the competition that Nissan with the Aria faces, you know, the likes of the Ionic 5, the Kia EV6, the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the ID4, of course, is very similar. So it's a pretty, and then there's other manufacturers, of course, in that midsize VinFast, the VF8's coming out, right? We have uh, even, you know, the likes of uh, Mercedes-Benz with the, the uh, EQB, you know, which is probably about this size, maybe a tad bigger. Um, it's hard to say, you know, when you look at these vehicles um, without looking at all the physical specs. So it's a very crowded space. And I would say the Nissan has their hands full in trying to differentiate themselves from that crowded space. But what they have put together is a really nice package. And let me get into closing summaries and talk about that. I'll just quickly summarize my driving uh, efforts for this week. As you can see by the chart, basically just filled it up, uh, sorry, charged it up to 100% once. Um, it showed me a starting range of 486 kilometers. Uh, I drove 388 kilometers of actual trip driving with a remaining range at the end of that uh, showing 62 kilometers uh, at 12% state of charge. So when I look at the numbers there, you see that column that shows um, plus or minus kilometers. If it's minus, that means the range prediction on the GOM or the gasometer or on the display was short of where it should have been. If it's over, if it's a positive number, then that means that the range underestimated the actual uh, driving range of the car, the range prediction. So in this case, uh, the um, area um, underestimated the actual range um, that I was going to get on that 100% battery charge by about 35 kilometers in this particular trip. And if you equate that into a percentage range loss, it shows up at about 7%. And that's pretty acceptable because it is a bigger, heavier vehicle and it was has been very hot and humid this week. We've had a heat wave with 35 to 40 degrees C temperatures with humidity. So I've been running the air conditioning almost full blast all the time while driving the car for most of this week. So that's going to take its toll on electricity use. So I think that that's okay, that that's pretty good, a 7% loss with a full AC. Um, as I'm stopping now in the last day or so to, to not be using the AC, I'm seeing my efficiencies get even better and better. But I did finish with a 17.8 kilowatt hour per 100 kilometer efficiency, which I thought was pretty good. Just wanted to quickly add that uh, when I charged it up the morning before taking it back the night before, 
it actually showed over 500 kilometers of range. I think around 507, 508, something like that. Um, so you can see by this shot, I've already driven 34 kilometers with 478 still showing. So it's over 500 uh, 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 kilometers. So obviously as the, um, uh, the computer software, the battery software learned my driving habits, it started to get better range because I drive eco mode and just kind of normally versus gunning it all the time. So uh, even though I had mentioned that the GOMs and that, you know, their guessometer sometimes and sometimes the, the OEMs aren't as accurate, um, the good thing is that the range was going up learning my, my habits. So I'm pretty confident that, you know, you'll get well over 400 kilometers on this, probably closer to 450 for just normal city driving. Uh, in the in the nice temperatures, so I think that that's really good, and uh, hope you uh, consider that as well. So this is really the first opportunity I've had to drive it, and to me that kind of seals the deal on this vehicle. You've got to really take one for a drive and test it out, because it really is a nice all-around comfortable vehicle. It's quiet, it's comfortable, it's got enough uh, peppiness to get you where you're going. It's got decent range, uh, the efficiency is okay, the charging's okay. You know, you could certainly road trip in this, so it, it hits all the bells. You know, there are a lot of great points on this. I don't know if anything stands out. I do love the design. I love the looks of it, the light package, everything that they've done with this, they've done a really, really good job, I think, in, in, in taking, evolving, and I'm gonna use the pun there intended, their all electrification vehicles to the next level. And this is, again, they're a little bit behind, they're a little bit late in catching up, but I believe that this vehicle has brought them back to the table, to the main stakes, and, and put them into the game. It's a really, really nice vehicle. Remember, you know, I interviewed Chris, who's uh, doing the pole-to-pole -pole expedition. He's taking one of these. It's a stock vehicle, other than some suspension mods, the tires, and some skid plates that he's put on there. The power is the same. He's got an all-wheel drive version, and he's driving from the magnetic north to the south pole in that thing, and he's, he's going all over the place. So it's a very capable, and don't let what you might read on forums and you what, what you know some people bashing Nissan because of their 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 slowness and kind of getting the leaf into the next generation um, don't let that hinder your thought points and your consideration of this vehicle as an all electric choice in your household because I think it's fantastic I really think it's a nice vehicle um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how they sell uh, at at the time of this filming they've sold about 900 or they delivered about 900 of these in Canada from the first half of this year in 2023 so that's pretty good for Canada um, I, speaking to some folks there they would they they would love to get more because they have more people waiting than that so they have a pretty healthy reservation list that continues to grow the the concern is going to be less like everybody else is supply chain and, and demand and as they ramp up production these are only built in Japan right now so that's the single point that they're all coming from then they get allocated around the world so it's, but it's probably going to be six months to a year I think is a safe bet I won't sugarcoat it is it worth the wait absolutely I recommend this vehicle for sure I think it's I think you'd be pleasantly surprised on how nice this vehicle is it's a very, very capable vehicle and definitely worth a look all right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show, my review of the 2023 Nissan Aria. This is the Evolve Plus front-wheel drive single mode variant. So I hope you enjoyed that and hope it gave you some good food for thought of consideration of yet another very capable all-electric, potentially, to join your family. So again, I want to thank Nissan Canada for allowing me the use of this vehicle. Always appreciate it when, I'm, when I get these press vehicles. As you folks know, I'm not at the top of the food chain when it comes to that. So you'll see a lot of other channels that have bigger subscribers that get these vehicles ahead of me. I just wait my turn and eventually I get them. But I try to give you, you know, really honest and thoughtful and uh, considerate reviews about the overall driving experience rather than focusing on zero to 60s and track times and some of this nonsense that other people do. I don't really care about that. It's more about how is this to drive and use in everyday practicality. Very, very good, strong competitor here. So again, thanks Nissan Canada. Hey, and thank you very much for watching. All the information on coming up uh, on how to contact me is coming up at the end of the show. Of course, if you wanna be Patreon, you can check that out. And I'm always humbly thankful for my Patreon supporters. You know who you are. If you're thinking of uh, helping me out, you wanna help me out on Patreon, just check out the site and get more information. And all my contact details coming up. So again, thank you very much for taking the time to tune in. Everybody stay safe. And until the next time, I will see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.